Uh, Dr. Jim Kearns from North Carolina State University is our guest today. Uh, we've got a special Wednesday edition of the Virginia Tech Turfgrass Tuesday. Jim's a turfgrass pathologist, associate professor down at NC State. Uh, I told him there should be plenty of things to talk about since 2018. It's been a very interesting year in the world of diseases. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Uh, uh, I don't usually like to put up words like this, but I was searching to figure out, you know, how did September rank um, in, in terms of, of heat? Because um, I suspect with Dr. McCall and, and Dr. Goatley and many others, the phone was probably ringing uh, a lot from August up to really just two weeks ago uh, when the weather finally broke. And I thought this was pretty interesting um, that at least in Raleigh, North Carolina, Conceivably, this is going to be different for many areas in the country, but if you can see, at least for us, the overall temperature for September was the fourth warmest on record for Raleigh, and that's 131 years of collecting that data. Um, so, you know, yes, it was extremely hot, but if you see there in red, I think this is what really did a lot of us, you know, in, or it gave us a lot of fits is the average low was the warmest observed in 31 years. And I didn't, I didn't have a chance to get it in this morning, but I actually saw on Twitter, uh, a gentleman out of Charlotte showed that it was the warmest by almost 1.3 degrees. Now you average that over 131 years, that is remarkable uh, to look at this. And really, as it says here, it didn't break until the 13th or 14th of October. So I think, in all honesty, when I think of bent grass putting greens, uh, those of you maybe in the mountains with bent grass fairways, uh, tall fescue lawns, you know, for the most part, up into July, things were really good. Uh, we didn't see many issues. And then August through September was probably the busiest our diagnostic lab has ever been. Um, and it ranged from you know, for us, since we had storms, it was not only Bermuda grass, it was bent grass, it was tall fescue. There was even large patch in St. Augustine and centipede grass, you know, in mid-August uh, in many cases. So I think one of the most unique years uh, we have ever seen. Uh, one of the couple of things I wanted to go over was some of our things that we see in the clinic. Uh, and just, just to give you an idea, of one of the reasons I like to talk about this is we see a lot of trends from around the country um, in terms of diseases people are facing. Uh, now, keep in mind, I think this is probably true for Dr. McCall as well, we tend to only get the difficult things uh, as things come in. You know, we rarely get dollar spot or brown patch um, fairy ring because most people can diagnose that on their own. And so as you see some of this data, what you'll notice is primarily of what we're seeing um, in the golf industry and the landscape industry are diseases that are hard to diagnose. Um, and I'm gonna try to give you a couple little keys on some of these diseases, but the fact of the matter is, given the expense of fungicides, um, issues with labor these days, you're, you're better off sending in a sample to uh, Virginia Tech, NC State, whomever you're most comfortable with to help guide you because at least in my experience, it's getting more challenging. So if you look, and I suspect it's fairly similar across the country, vast majority of our customers, you know, are golf courses. Um, and why is that? And those of you, if you're not in the golf industry, it's what I ask you to think about. Um, even the golf industry. Um, and most people say, you know, standards, uh, they can't tolerate this. And yes, that's true. But I think the fundamental thing is mowing height. You know, one of the biggest issues that we see, especially outside of the golf business, um, are people mowing tall fescue too low. Um, Lee Butler always says it's called tall fescue for a reason. It's not called short fescue. Uh, proper mowing heights of zoysia grasses, St. Augustine. And then for the golf business, 
in some cases, it seems like we've forgotten a little bit about altering mowing heights. Um, that when academics, I think, ask to raise the mowing height, we're not asking to go from 100 to 150. You know, we're asking to go from 100 to 110, 115, and switch from the groove to the solid rollers. All of those things are going to dramatically improve the tolerance that you may have to a lot of these issues that we'll discuss. And I understand, yes, uh, you have issues of maintaining ball roll distance, but it's either maintaining the plan health or not in some cases. And it's important to keep in mind that even minor increases can result in 10 to 12% increase in photosynthetic area for the plant. And that could be the difference of a fungicide working and a fungicide not. Uh, I think that's really important. So you can see uh, uh, homeowners, landscapers here, um, and some sod farms. We actually have an ornamental grass nursery uh, we get a lot of samples from, and that's also interesting. We, whether that's due to our climate, um, increased production, I don't know, but we see a lot of issues even there. Uh, if we look at the non-golf, if you're on a uh, nursery, uh, most of what we get is from a homeowner. And I think this is really important for those of you who have a landscape business is keep in mind our homeowners these days are savvy. They're looking up what Virginia Tech may be putting out, what NC State may be putting out and, and using those services and checking up on when you might be recommending a particular uh, procedure or fungicide treatment or aerification. Uh, for disease. So um, I encourage those to stay in contact with blogs or, uh, you know, uh, a service like this, which I think is awesome. You can come back and look at over and over. And I think this is really important. Um, keep in mind that even though I'm a pathologist and, um, you know, like to, in some cases, look at disease in our research trials, a lot of what comes into labs isn't a disease. Um, that turf can struggle and die from abiotic issues. Um, and I think I'm just using the landscape samples. You'll see it in the golf samples in a little bit. But even in the landscape, 53% of what we get, you know, out of we probably get 200 a year from the landscape. So 100 of them aren't even a disease. Uh, maybe a misapplication of a herbicide, fertility, you know, in some cases well, what mother nature threw us this year, if it's underwater and hot, it's going to basically cook. Um, so a lot of different things can kill turf and it's not always a disease when something goes uh, afoul. Jim, for many years here in our lab, the number one landscape disease on turf has been dull mower disease. And I think that continues to be the pattern uh, when we're searching because you can't find any pathogen, but you just look at those leaf blades and they're absolutely being shredded. That's, that's a big one. I mean, as I drive even through the Triangle area now, it is amazing at how poor people take care of their lawnmowers. Um, I mean, you see that sheen through the yards. Uh, and, and the one thing I advocate here uh, for myself, and I know with Dr. McCall and, and uh, uh, the lab at Virginia Tech, I mean, we are trained to look for these organisms. And if we don't feel like they're the issue, it's probably not the issue. Um, now, one thing I will advocate here, um, at least for us, uh, and you guys can ask uh, Dave and the lab at Virginia Tech, but um, we, we are coming to the point to where uh, we aren't going to accept samples anymore without a photo. Uh, because that photo just tells so much for that diagnostic process. Um, because why I say that is most people believe turf is a sterile environment. And there's always some organism in there, whether it's a nematode or a fungus. Uh, and the term we use is a buzzard. Uh, there's lots of buzzards in there. And the photo can help us pinpoint, okay, what are you seeing? 
um, and could probably identify, all right, did we really get a good sample representation of that particular symptom? So um, Dr. McCall may hate me for this, but I encourage sending in photos uh, if you're sending in a sample because for us, it goes a long way to help provide a better service back to the grower. So here's kind of the things that we've been seeing. Um, and I think these Bermuda grasses are marching their way in, even up into Virginia. Um, we're seeing more and more samples on Bermuda grass putting greens. Um, I, I think the, we know now that it's, they're not gonna say fungicides uh, in many cases that um, the conversion should be done for when are your golfers playing the most golf. Um, I think that's the best metric to use. Um, and unfortunately, as you'll see, they're, they are susceptible to a number of different uh, diseases. Um, you know, one of the things I find interesting with Bermuda grass and why it, I think it can be nice is we don't see the diseases to be as detrimental as we did on bent grass. You know, Pythium root rot on bent grass in July, that can be detrimental if we miss an application. Um, Bermuda grass, I think we know as long as it doesn't hit in September and October, you know, we have pretty good recuperative potential. Um, when we get into some of these fall diseases like we had with the heat, humidity re remaining and these moisture systems, unfortunately, some of those symptoms are we're going to see until the spring. Um, but showing you, you know, ornamental grasses, zoysia and fescue, still up there for our landscape samples there. Um, if we just break it out through landscape, um, we, we are seeing a lot more zoysia grass. I don't know, Mike, if you guys are seeing more and more of that up there. We are, and we're seeing the same thing. The more you get, the more disease that we're reporting. And interestingly enough, at least most of our agents and even landscapers, they're, they're really good with large patch on zoysia grass. One of the biggest issues we've seen with it is dollar spot. Uh, and that July, August, September, I think, as it's burning out of some of its nitrogen, uh, we see it come in and people don't really know what it is. Uh, and then in the spring of the year, it's this, uh, these black spots, you know, they're about yay big, which is curvularia. And it doesn't seem to do a substantial amount of damage, but it sure looks ugly. And I know people, get a lot of questions about it. I just threw this in here. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. For those of you who want to come back and look, uh, just the various cultivars. Uh, and why I put this in is people always ask, you know, what cultivar should I plant? Uh, whether it's bent grass, Bermuda grass. And I, unfortunately, I don't keep track of it with tall fescue because I don't think most people know, or zoysia grasses. Um, Keep in mind, this is a reflection of probably what's planted in the southeast. Uh, not necessarily susceptibility that, you know, uh, at least for Bermuda grass, a lot of what we see is champion and mini verde. And I bet if we asked growers what they have, it would reflect that pretty well. And the same here for with bent grass. I mean, there's still a lot out there they don't really know. Um, or it's some other thing like some of the newer varieties, as you see, they're finally starting to creep in like a T1 and, you know, maybe this pure distinction over time as it uh, grows in popularity. But I think this reflects really what's planted out there. Um, if you look at bent grass putting green samples, it's not that it's getting any easier. As I mentioned, as Mike mentioned really well, the more of another species that's planted, the more we tend to see it come in. I think with bent grass, growers out there, most of them have a really good idea of what root rot looks like now. Um, you know, some of the ones that we see that people struggle with are things like nematodes, summer patch, uh, but some of the standard diseases on bent, they know pretty well. And I think this explains it quite well with creeping bent grass. Uh, I don't have 2018 tabulated yet. Uh, I'll have that for the meeting. Um, in January. So those of you come to the meeting, you see that. I suspect for 2018, 
this is going to be pretty high. And that's just given from what I have seen, very unusual because Lee and I joke every year that I could change this number, you know, and it would be the same. But starting in June, really, I mean, we get inundated in July uh, with samples and then through August. And, you know, I think most people say if we can make it to August 15th, September 1st with bent grass, we're usually in the clear. However, this year was an exception. Um, and people were spraying, you know, signature daconil much later than I've ever seen, Segway much later than I've ever seen. And, you know, I, we didn't see a lot of disease, to be honest, uh, in September and October on bent grass putting greens. It was a lot of, I guess the best way I could say it is they were just worn down. Um, it's, it's all they could take um, at that time of the year. Uh, so just, just an abysmal year, I think, for September and October. You know, at a recent meeting last year, I was presenting some of this data, and, and a superintendent, I think down in Florida, said, well, what does the height of cut look like? And we actually tabulate that on our forms. And uh, if you look at Bencrass, this is another reason – you know, I think, I, I hope, I, I don't know where Mike stands on this, but it's, I think Virginia may be the northern extreme of some of these Bermuda grass greens. Um, but I think this shows why bent grass, you know, we, it can really struggle in this transition environment that people are mowing them high. Um, you know, you look at this 131 to 140, and that's, you know, 120 to 140, the majority of our samples. It really shows that the climate is is tough, um, and without a good, strong preventative fungicide program, and more importantly, cultural practices of top dressing, you know, needle timing fans um, are the only way to really win the battle for our summer months. Um, and then I think that shows it. It just bent grass can really struggle in our environment. I I am very pleased that I see very few down at 120 or lower at that time of the year. There was a time, I think Mike remembers, where people were kind of pushing the limits, um, and that was about 10 and 11, and there was a lot of catastrophic losses of turf uh, in those times. And I'm glad we're kind of moving back towards, um, you know, maybe a more reasonable height to cut during our stressful summers. Jim, I tell them, I tell them they just got, they got greedy. Yeah, they do darn good, and they could do it for so long. But I always try to remind them, Mother Nature is ultimately going to win those battles. Exactly, and it's it's amazing to me the the product that they're able to provide to golfers, and golfers really have no clue the stress that goes in, you know, into that. Um, and I still think we could provide good ball roll distance and good true surfaces, even at you know one. 130, 135, and I think people are realizing that with some of the new rollers and uh, frequent top dressing and things, I think help. So looking at bentgrass, you'll see here, you know, 60% of what we got in 2016 wasn't even a disease. Um, this is numerous other things. And one thing I will comment in here is our lab in particular we don't do the nematode assays in our lab. We send those to the North Carolina Department of Ag because they're much better equipped to do the nematode assays than we are. And this would, would include some of that, um, that when we talk to a superintendent, we'd say, you know, it looks like nematode feeding, but when we wash those, the sand away, we wash those nematodes down the drain. And, I, you know, Unfortunately, whether it's because we're looking now, because we have a lot of new products, or it is increasing, you know, nematodes are a major factor uh, for stress of bent and Bermuda grass putting greens. And those of you on the coastal areas, I'm seeing major issues in landscape turf, zoysia grass, St. Augustine, centipede, um, even tall fescue grown in sandy areas, we're seeing you know, nematode issues. King for bent grass has been Pythium root rot. So I suspect I'll spend a good amount of time of this 
um, at the Mid-Atlantic meeting in January. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with this particular organism. But as you're looking at these, I want you to look at what do you notice? Uh, the vast majority of what's coming in, and I think it's true for Dr. McCall, it's all below ground at the crown or roots um, from anthracnose to summer patch to, you know, heaven forbid, black layer um, is still a major player out there. Uh, some algae issues and, you know, even though we work in an environment that we get, you know, 35 to 60 inches of rainfall, depending on where you are, um, we test the samples that come in for uh, salts. And we see extreme salts build up really in this top, you know, portion. Um, and I, I do think that's an issue because we don't find a pathogen associated with it. We see that turf declining. Um, and people who have gone back and done a deep irrigation see that turf kind of perk back up. And remember, even in the transition zone, we can go periods of two months without any appreciable rain. And all the things you apply to a putting green are a salt. <laughs> and they can accumulate back up near that surface. So, you know, just, I guess, some things to think about. You know, one I hear a lot about is take-all patch. And in the transition zone, take-all patch is a minor issue outside of the mountain areas. Uh, around Blacksburg, I would suspect they would see it in uh, sand cap tees, fairways, and greens. We see it in the mountains of North Carolina. But in the Piedmonts and coastal plains, we have never seen this disease on bent grass putting greens. But yet I hear a lot of people talking about it. Um, and they may be using another lab, but what we have seen as an issue, and it looks very similar, is summer patch. Um, for us in, in the Carolinas, has been a major problem on creeping bent grass putting greens. And I mention that because managing that disease is different than take all. Take all is managed early in the year, uh, fairly readily, or fairly easily, I should say, whereas summer patch can continue to infect all summer long. And so that's where people, I think, have said, well, I, I think I have take all patch. I made two applications in the spring, yet I still have this symptom. And you know, I'll talk about that uh, briefly as we go through this. So looking at some of these diseases, you can see when the bulk of disease activity is on bent grass through the summer months. Uh, keep in mind our climate, the transition zone can be wonky. <laughs> Look at, we diagnosed pythium root dysfunction in January. Well, it got warm, it got dry. Um, and these pathogens can develop. Look at summer patch in March, right? I think if I remember correctly in March, we were pretty warm in 2017. Or what's more fresh is, uh, weren't we 80, 85 degrees for a couple weeks in February this year? You know, and, and things can pop up quickly during those times uh, because remember, bent grass really isn't growing all that much at that time of year. Bermuda grass is increasing because we're seeing more of it planted, basically. Um, I think this is something to keep in mind that we get samples of Bermuda grass all year long. Um, most of it, if you can tabulate it, is, you know, August through no August, basically through March. Uh, but we get these cloudy periods, like these storms that come through diseases start to show up on these Bermuda grass greens. Um, to me, the lesson here is um, it's not so much about temperature with Bermuda grass, it's more about light. If light levels are decreased, pathogens are opportunistic and they're going to take... This is something I thought was just a little alarming as we started tabulating it. Um, I suspect most of these are from down around Florida. Uh, we, we get a fair bit of samples from down there uh, because their major golf season is during the most stressful part of the year. But I, I do see some around our neck of the woods. 
Uh, if we want to tolerate our fall, winter, and spring, I think, you know, inching towards these higher heights of cut are, are really important. Um, and, and it's going to help with diseases. For example, uh, the story I tell is when we put in our first Bermuda grass putting green, uh, because we, we had a substantial amount of bent grass putting greens, we were mowing everything at the same height, 135, 140. Uh, we could hardly get a disease on our Bermuda grass putting greens. Uh, we had to lower it down to below 120 to really start seeing uh, disease activity. So just, you know, something to keep in mind. So what are we seeing here? Again, we do see no pathogen. It's not as much as creeping bent grass. Uh, this particular beast. So those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, I guess it's something that Dr. Martin and I have kind of pushed um, is we use the term take all root rot. This is analogous to uh, Bermuda grass decline or warm season decline of, or a root decline of warm season diseases. Um, I have no earthly idea why, but this is been a bane of our ultra dwarf putting greens in, in the transition zone climate. Um, it's one we're working on frantically to try to get answers to um, and uh, talk a little bit about that uh, in the mid-Atlantic. I don't know if I have some slides in there uh, right now, but basically, um, because it's fresh, what we know right now, the best fungicides for this disease are Lexicon, Tartan, Briskway, um, Headway, and Mirage. Um, another one that we've seen some decent results with is Tekken. It's a new product from PBI Gordon, which is a mixture of Kabodo and Tebiconazole. Really nice mixture for this time of year because it's phenomenal spring dead spot control. And you're getting the tebuconazole to help with this take all root rot. Uh, the difference with the take all is it's, it's really not two applications that are effective. We really need potentially three in the fall of the year and an additional one or two in the spring depending on our weather conditions. Uh, whereas, at least I think in, in Dr. McCall's trials and ours, if we target spring dead spot well in the fall of, fall of the year, we can get away with two applications uh, of a good product pretty well. So we still see leaf spot. Uh, root knot nematode has been a, a substantial issue of these Bermuda grass greens, even Pythium root rot, mini ring. Um, so a number of, of issues out there. So I guess one thing you can maybe take away from uh, the webinar today is those of you who have Bermuda grass that are listening in, uh, we see these diseases all the time. Uh, and I use this as a uh, means of education that I think the phosphite or phosphonate products are really important for Bermuda grass grades. Um, things like Signature, Appear, Allude or other companies like Tidal Fight or numerous other phosphites out there, going out with those every two to three weeks can help minimize a lot of this. Uh, these phosphonate and phosphite products, um, yes, they have plant health, some capabilities, but they're also exceptional fungicides. Um, and I think that's a big key. Uh, that we tend to forget about. So uh, this in here, you know, why are this, these diseases, why are we getting these in? Uh, why are they difficult to manage? Just some key points. Uh, the symptoms and signs are underground. They're difficult uh, to diagnose early. Um, I think this is one of the biggest things to keep in mind um, and you'll see, at least from us, some blog posts. We're going to talk about some basic plant disease epidemiology um, uh, in the future, in that there are things called the incubation period and latent period for diseases. So, and that's what this bullet addresses. 
that infection happens and symptoms may not develop until two, three weeks, a month, two months after infection. And once you see the symptoms, you have to remember that so much damage may have already been done that it can be hard to overcome it. So that's where, you know, we can go out with multiple fungicides and not see a response partly because the damage has already been done. This is why we harp so much on preventative disease management because of this particular bullet. And I think this is just absolutely critical. Um, and this is what we're trying to figure out with these diseases. When is the best time to do this? The other issue is there's significant barriers to control. Thatch, poor infiltration, um, maybe not having the ability to water in these fungicides. We'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, I think those of you who may have heard me before, I talk about this a lot. Um, you can have the best fungicide program in the world, but if the soil conditions are not conducive for plant growth, they're not gonna work. Um, so they may need to be remediated, whether it's looking at drainage, uh, aggressive verification, um, a consistent wetting agent program for something like a farrier. All those really need to be looked at. So not to spend a lot of time here, um, but keep in mind a lot of these problems look very similar from a distance. These are four different problems in turf. None of them are a disease. They're all abiotic. And yet, they were all submitted to the lab or emailed to myself or Lane Fredway or others thinking potentially they had a disease issue. So I think that's important to keep in mind. So how do we do this? These are some of the keys I want to give you uh, basically to kind of uh, prep you for the talk in uh, the Mid-Atlantic. We'll probably review this because I think they're that important. But remember, diseases progress. They start small, gradually increase in size and severity. So I think this is a good time to think about it now that we're a little bit cooler, um, especially those of you, I know you're out there all the time. Um, mark an area, paint the spot. Did it get bigger? Um, I think that is critical. And then you still have that little dot there to evaluate whether the fungicide worked. That when diseases pop up, it can happen uh, because of that infect or uh, incubation period of from the time of infection to the time of symptom development, but most of the time they're starting small and they gradually increase in size. This is key and this is where the photos I think come in really handy. You know, we ask for samples from the edge of affected turf because there's usually a transition from healthy to dead turf when you're dealing with a disease. Uh, and I think that's important. You know, look at that edge. Is it a different color? Um, you know, is there something unique? Is it more of a wavy kind of jagged pattern? If there's typically straight lines and it's healthy and dead, it's highly likely that's not a disease, right? That something else has occurred. I think this is one where the photos are really important. Um, and I know this happens. You know, you get in the period of um, crisis management, um, and we can overlook patterns at times. Um, that looking at that, you know, they don't develop in straight lines or other regular patterns. That's where, you know, photos come in handy because, yes, on an area that could be dead like this, we might be able to find anthracnose or summer patch or pythium root rot, but you see the entire photo and you see those things going up and down. Um, it really helps. And one thing I advocate with this particular bullet is we always want to jump in and start looking at the turf with our, you know, hand lens and getting into microscopes, but take the step back. You know, which way did the sprayer go when it sprayed last? Which way did I mow last? Which way did I aerify last? 
Um, all of those things play a big role in distinguishing whether it's a disease or not. Um, and advocate that you look at that. Um, because, you know, in some cases, yes. You send in a photo. For example, one of the biggest submissions we've got for photos in the past two weeks or three weeks is mini ring on Bermuda grass. Unmistakable from the photo. Um, you see it and you're like, yep, that's mini ring. And then the superintendent would say, we see it on a couple greens. That's pretty good. A red flag flag goes up in my mind when they say it's all it's on all 18 greens. You know, it could be a disease, don't get me wrong, but I start to become skeptical at that time. And that's all I advocate um, is to be a skeptic as you're looking through this. Don't always think that it's a disease. Those of you in the landscape um, and the mountains of North Carolina and Virginia, where you have a mixed stand, uh, disease is usually only going to attack one species in there. So is it bent? Is it poa? Is it tall fescue? Uh, is it the ryegrass? Um, what is being taken out? Because that's, you know, really, really important. For example, uh, we struggled with a course, and I tweeted about this. Those of you who saw about, um, they saw basically a blighting on a fairway. It, it turned out it was only the annual bluegrass, um, and it was kind of a, a blight. They thought it was Pythium, it turned out to be Summer Patch. But if it was Pythium, we would expect maybe the ryegrass to go down first, which we have in our mountains, uh, versus the annual bluegrass or even creeping bentgrass. And so that's where I mean of looking at those mixed stands. Now, those of you in the landscape, the past few weeks, we've been getting a lot of samples in or a lot of images in of just completely dead areas. Um, and people will find lesions on St. Augustine or tall fescue thinking it's gray leaf spot. And I mean, everything is dead. Crabgrass, you know, <laughs> that was either herbicide or flooding or, you know, who knows whatever else uh, in that particular situation. And that leads me to the reason why we have people like Dr. Askew and Yelverton and others studying weeds is because they're tough. Uh, they're resistant to most of our organisms or most of our pathogens. They'll survive attack, right, from, for example, if you didn't know, crabgrass gets gray leaf spot. Um, you'll see it every year, uh, August through the end of September, nice lesions, and yet it never suffers from it, like St. Augustine or tall fescue or perennial ryegrass. Uh, I don't know, Mike, if you've seen it with some athletic fields, lost some substantial areas and they usually pre-treat but uh, you know I, I take a little bit of the blame for this I didn't even think of gray leaf spot being a problem because we've never seen it uh, in that overseed situation with perennial ryegrass so um, one of the keys there that I saw this year that I rarely get to see is if you see perennial ryegrass or new tall fescue seedlings and they do this that's a classic sign of gray leaf spot. And uh, I saw it in my lawn in tall fescue and I actually missed it. It was my wife who said, hey, our new seedlings are dying. <laughs> and went out and looked and they were all, had that shepherd's crook and, and sprayed them and, and they recovered, thank goodness. Uh, some others, maybe not. So this is one that's a little hard to do over a webinar, but I give you a little preview uh, for when I'll speak. Um, I ask people, you know, what is what are these? When we talk about soil-borne diseases, they, they all appear similar. Uh, one is root rot, one is summer patch, and one is root dysfunction of creeping bentgrass. And I hear far too many people on Twitter, Facebook, um, emails or conferences saying, well, I have this, I have that. And I just wonder, how do you know? If you haven't had it diagnosed in the past, I don't feel comfortable distinguishing these, right? I, I know what they are because I took the picture and brought the sample back or the sample was, or the picture was submitted with the sample, right? So we have root dysfunction here, summer patch, and pythium root rot. And, you know, you might say, well, you can understand this one, totally different fungicides. 
But even with the two pythium diseases, it's a different management strategy. Uh, root dysfunction is different from root rot. Uh, they can go hand in hand, even at the same facility, but their management is different. I think that's really, really important because I've seen still too many people get burned on root rot because they're trying to manage for root dysfunction. So keep that in mind and use the people in your states. Um, you know, we're really spoiled on the East Coast. We have a number of turf faculty at Virginia Tech, um, NC State, Clemson, Maryland. You know, think of those out West where there's really one or two faculty anymore for a massive area. Um, so use that service uh, that extension is providing. Here's Bermuda grass. Those of you who might be growing Bermuda grass. One is take all root rot, one's pythium root rot, one's root not nematode. <laughs> which one's which? And, you know, I know when I give these talks, uh, people always, you know, they, I think they enjoy these of taking a guess and, well, I got them right. Well, do you, do you want to take that chance out in the field? Because I don't. Um, one of the things, if you could be a fly on the wall when we get samples in, if when Lee calls me in for help, uh, we're just like, I, I don't know what that patch is because Bermuda grass, to me, has been one of the more difficult ones to work with because uh, they're all patches. As you see, patch, 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 right? This is take all root rot. This is pythium root rot. Some people are savvy and can tell this is a slope and it's kind of running. And believe it or not, root knot nematode shows up as a patch on Bermuda grass green. So uh, I know we've been talking a lot about that. So a little bit of a joke in here, right? Some of us aren't very good at field diagnosis and somebody needs to tell her that that's a mushroom and not what she thinks it is there. So what I wanna finish up here briefly on is just some of the trends that we're seeing in fungicides, uh, some control, and I'm gonna kind of go through these quickly. Um, I just put this question up because we're starting to see this at our research farm. Um, some uh, loss of control with SDHIs. Now, I think we're going to see it first because we tend to use things like Emerald and ProStar to manage specific diseases so we can have a dollar spot trial without a lot of brown patch or a lot of brown patch without a lot of dollar spot in. But the point being is these SDHI, so products like Exemplar, Valista, Kibodo, uh, Posterity. Um, I know I'm missing others <laughs> out there, but you're going to see more and more of these SDHIs, and we have to protect these products. Um, so thinking of these rotations. So uh, for us, this is what we see with Valista, Exemplar, um, and uh, even fluopyram by itself um, because we, we weren't diligent in our own research site of rotating chemistries um, and we're starting to see a loss of control. Um, we don't want to see that because they're phenomenal products uh, in most cases. Just showing you some of that data here and you know what do you see? Some of these tank mix products still work really really well. Um, I put in a DMI for something like Dollar Spot. Those of you who may struggle with it, we have forgotten about DMIs and they're still good. Yes, there's some resistance out there, um, but in a rotation, pro or rotation program, they're still really, really good. Um, so don't forget about those. I just put this in here. Um, you know, there's a lot of information out here. Those of you who deal with Dollar Spot, uh, keep in mind now on uh, Bill Kreuzer's uh, Greenkeeper app, uh, Paul Koch now has this up on his website at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I believe Syngenta is going to incorporate this into their Greencast um, service that the dollar, a model that a colleague of mine, Damon Smith, and I developed. Uh, basically, it's worked very, very well. Those of you in Dollar Spot country and probably the Blacksburg area, uh, mountains of North Carolina, this is something that's out there for you. And it, on average, has given us equal control to 
spraying on a calendar. And typically in every location has been able to save one to two fungicide applications. So that can help those of you who have, I know, been crunched with budgets. Um, so just something to keep in mind out there. Basically, this goes over how we did it. Um, it was pretty labor intensive early on. We went out and counted spots every single day um, in Wisconsin and Oklahoma. And the reason we did that is that we painted those new spots that developed. So we were able to track new disease development according to weather. Um, and that's basically how this model was developed. Now, those of you who may not be familiar with this, um, one of the things I like about the model is it allows you to accept how much risk you want to take. So it's basically much like a weather forecast of, do you want to take a lot of risk or do you not want to have a lot of risk? So what you'll see here are these, you have to actually pick a risk. I think for most of the models, they're going to assume 20%. And the reason for that is that's where we saw the best prediction of disease, right? Um, with almost no breakthrough, right? No dollar spot development. Uh, but given your budget and your situation, you may want to accept more risk, 25%, right? Keep in mind that it may not give you what you are looking for. Okay, now at really high-end properties, you get down to 15 to 10%, you know, gives you really good control, right? You'll notice there are differences among years, right? That if you accept a lot of risk, some years may be really good, other years it may not, okay? And it shows you the number of applications there in parentheses. Um, so bottom line, if you use this model, I would advocate, you know, starting at your facility at 20 to 25 percent. Don't assume a whole lot of risk because keep in mind this doesn't account for microclimates, uh, your fertility practices, your variety of grass, whatever it might be out there, and then you can adjust based on what you see for this. Um, I hope people realize that the model is never an end-all be-all. It's a guide uh, to help you, you know, manage a disease better. So this I took directly from Dr. Koch's website. Um, it, I think it shows how the model works. Uh, it basically gives you a dollar spot probability. So as basically relative humidity and temperatures become co conducive, as it gets to where it intersects this 20% risk, right? This is where we'd wanna make our first application. You'll notice disease probability keeps going up, but if we are assuming some sort of level of protection, whether it's 28 days, 21 days, 14 days, that's also uh, from the practitioner. What do you wanna get out of that fungicide, okay? You'll notice in this case, theoretically, it dropped below, so we don't need another application here. As it comes back, we make the second application and essentially disease is prevented. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and in a talk, we'll have a little bit more time to dive into this. This is showing you where you can find it now. I don't know if Syngenta has it up as of yet, uh, but these are two great resources where you can get this model and play with it yourself. Those of you, if you haven't seen Dr. Kreuzer's Greenkeeper app, I mean, this is a really robust service to help you with a lot of things, growing degree day intervals for uh, numerous products, including growth regulators. It'll help track, right, products for you. Just a really nice service. So uh, I know I'm getting short on time here, but a couple quick things, you know, uh, to keep in mind. Um, one of the things I noticed, this is a little bit older data, uh, but when we were mixing in, a good strong growth regulator in with our dollar spot products. I mean, we saw, you know, substantial, you know, control, really good control uh, with it. And I think that helps limit some of that growth and some of the um, removal of that particular fungicide out of that system. So those of you who don't know about a new, um, I think it's been pretty good on cool season grasses. And it, at least in this program approach, 
um, in some extreme dollar spot pressure provided uh, a nice component into that tank mixture. One of the new products, if you're not familiar, out there is Traction. So this is from New Farm. It's a tank mixture of Secure and Tebuconazole. Um, I don't know if Dr. McCall's worked with this one. I suspect he has. Um, amazing dollar spot control uh, in our trials. And then another one we've seen some nice results with is Pinpoint. Uh, this is a strobulurin or a QOI, believe it or not, Mandy Strobin. Works good on dollar spot. It doesn't do much for brown patch, <laughs> as you see here, but it gives you, you know, some alternatives in there. Um, looking at something like Exemplar, you know, that's where that product works really well. It gives you a lot of different things. So I'm going to skip a few slides here because I wanted to get to one thing in particular. Um, some of the questions we've gotten this summer uh, is about watering in. So we've been looking at this with Pythium root rot. And I think most of you know with Pythium root rot, Segway is kid. Um, in our trials, we've not seen a difference between the half rate, 0.45, and 0.9. They've been equally excellent. Um, so this is one artifact I present about uh, the trial work that we do. That if you look at this, you know, notice we don't see a statistical difference between watering it immediately and leaving it on the surface. Um, we did see it with Signature, right? That if we left it on the surface, the phosphonate products, that's really good root rot control. And I don't know if that surprises some of you. It surprised me um, because we don't really think about that as a product. But so think about this as kind of a base and then we insert the segue. And people ask, you know, can I water in later? Can I water in? You know, do I have to water in? And this is just what I want you to keep in mind as I started thinking about this. This is variability of root rot in our trial. This is a disease that we cannot readily inoculate, so it's hard to get good uniform disease. This is the watered in. So I want you to think about this, that these were four greens that you were spraying, or four areas, right? Do you want to accept an average of two and a half, or do you want to accept an average of six, right, percent disease? To give you an example, you'll see these pop up. This was a little study I did in Wisconsin where I painted uh, an area of a patch disease. So this is 5%. I'm thinking most people are going to notice that, even golfers. So I don't ever think that my work is the end all be all. That it is, again, a guide showing that it, it uh, shows what products work. But when we look at the variability, and you have 18 greens that are all variable. Do you want to accept an average of this or an average of this not watering it in? So we've done a lot as far as looking at watering in fungicides here. And one thing I want to point your attention to in the root rot column here is look at where we even watered in Signature and Dacanil. There was no difference in this program as far as root rot control. So that being said is I know budgets are tight. It can be hard to separate tanks. I'm not advocating you do this all the time, but if you get into a period to where, well, I can't just do a Segway app and then come back and do my signature Dacanil, we can water them in together, right? Again, I'm not advocating that every time. I want to be clear because I know somebody will say, Jim said I can water everything in. And that's not what Jim is saying. Uh, but if we get into a bind, you can still do that and get that protection even up on the surface. And that's what I want to try to leave you with today is this is what we've been looking at. And this is just a teaser and I'll have more of this and in the conference in January where we're looking at Michelobutanil. Why do we pick Michelobutanil? Because they donated radio labeled material, which is really expensive. Uh, and it allows us to track it in the soil column. So you look at this, this is the amount of irrigation applied immediately after application. There is no turf in this system. This is 90% sand, 10% peat mixed as a USGA putting green in a column. 
We coat the interior of the column so we don't get preferential flow down the sides uh, to prevent movement of fungicides that way. And we had different irrigation treatments from an eighth, quarter, half to an inch. Look at the inch irrigation, even uh, at you know, 50 per, almost 50% is still retained in the top inch. So it really shows these fungicides, I want you to keep in mind, are the, the bigger player here is the ag market. And how are fungicides applied in big agriculture? From an airplane, right? Or from overhead irrigation, or from a tractor that is well above the canopy in many cases, right? That um, they're designed to stick to organic surfaces because they don't want it to get down uh, in many cases because they do seed treatments for an annual crop that works well. That doesn't work well for a perennial crop. So the bottom line is, I think this shows readily that leaving it on the surface, you're leaving 25% of the material up there, right? And that could be critically important to managing a soil borne disease. You'll notice that we're not really getting a lot of movement much past four inches. Uh, that's okay too, because most of the pathogen activity is in that top two inches anyway, right? So we're getting more material down there by doing this post-application irrigation. Do we need a half inch or an inch? No, I don't think so, right? But we do need somewhere between an eighth and a quarter. Um, and the thing I've been advocating most is let's get away from, well, is that three minutes, five minutes? I don't know. Um, I know on our research farm, because we've measured it, we can get an eighth of an inch of water in five to six minutes in our system, right? A quarter of an inch is 20 minutes for us. So it goes up quite a bit. And uh, I always like what Dr. Martin says, a quarter of an inch in some of our nematode trials, it's puddling on that surface. So that's what I'm going to advocate and, and leave you with. Um, a lot of this you'll see once again when we inoculate, eighth of an inch, look at the better control. Here's a tenth. This is with summer patch of creeping bent grass. So I think that shows really well when we water in immediately how much better these things work. Okay, uh, do a couple more skips because this is really where I wanted to leave you at the end of this was this gray leaf spot. Uh, I don't know, Mike, if you guys have been getting a lot of questions about it. Um, believe it or not, an old faithful that we tend to not use anymore, thiophenic methyl has been outstanding in our trials. Uh, we do this work in cooperation with Melody Frazier at uh, Pure Seed. Um, I don't know uh, if she just has a massive uh, bank of inoculum over there, but uh, she gets a lot of gray leaf spot on her tall fescue, and we've had exceptional control. Now, you'll see some things that aren't labeled for home lawns. Keep in mind, we're doing this not only for home lawns, but for athletic fields and sod producers as well. So chlorothalonil is not labeled for home lawn use. Can't do that, but it really didn't improve the control we saw with thiophanic methyl. Now, one of the things we notice is you see the QOI still work, you know, look at insignia. It provides suppression, but I think that's where we need, whether it's climate or whatever, as we talked about early, um, I think July through September, we need to be thinking about mixing thiophanic methyl in to some of these fungicide applications. And we're going to try to address this. I've been trying to wrap my head about how to do this, but I wonder if a lot of our seedling blight in the past has been gray leaf spot. And we just assumed it was Pythium or Rhizoctonia. So we're going to try to address this over the winter. Um, and maybe by the meeting, I'll be able to uh, show some of that. But just to give you an idea, um, the lesions of gray leaf spot, pretty distinct from brown patch. Uh, I think most people have been able to uh, diagnose that. Mike, I think you can see, again, that could probably be a stress that we're adding on to predispose it to turf, but 
look at the damage that this disease can develop. And this is one, I don't say this very often, this is a disease that I find scary because it can cause damage at an alarming rate. 